Our first strategic plan presentation will be from Team Richmond out of Virginia. Let's give a warm welcome to our fellows. All right, so now that we got the jitters out of the way, um, welcome to the Richmond team's final presentation for the Flamboyant Fellowship. My name is Erin Brown, and I'm the Director of Family and Community Engagement for Richmond Public Schools. For the past two years, we have been on a journey to uncover the real life experiences of our Richmond Public Schools families. This experience has shed light on some inequities in our system that we want to strategically address. More than anything, this process has taught us that the work of improving family engagement starts with listening. So before we jump into our final recommendations, let's listen in on a no holds barred interview with some of our families. This conversation will be facilitated by one of our partners, Child Savers and Ladisha Batten. Please note that for this part of our presentation, our team members are gonna lean into their personal identities to represent demographics of our families. The words you'll hear, the stories, the conversation come directly from themes and quotes that we heard during our empathy interviews. We're gonna be representing our Latin American and newcomer families, our working class black families, and our middle class and more well-resourced white families. So with that, let's listen in on the flamboyant no holds bar, tell all, because we love good tea, right? And I'm gonna give it to Ladisha to take it away. Thank you, Erin. I'm excited to talk with my guests today about their experiences as RPS parents. Everyone, please help me welcome Chastity Rodriguez <laughs> and Kinga Garrett and Grady Hart. So we're all aware that RPS is an urban school district with a predominantly African-American population, most coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. In recent years, we've had an influx of English, English, learning, English language learners that have brought with them rich cultural traditions and a variety of languages. As a result, the second largest population of scholars are Latin American students who speak Spanish as their primary language and make up about 20% of the student population. While the division has several strategies in place to support the English language learner students like the Welcome Center and the Growing Language Justice Department, there are still some gaps. So Ms. Rodriguez, this first question is for you. Can you share with us more about your experience as a newcomer family and how you've adjusted to RPS in the last school year? Um, you want me to share about my experience in the Richmond Public Schools? Well, it's very different than the system in my country. There are a lot of things, like places and people, and I'm not always sure what to do or where to go when I need a specific thing. It's hard because a lot of people assume that since I speak Spanish, they can't help me. So I'm often told to go to the side and wait a long time. I did get a card from someone, I can't remember who, to get help in my language, and sometimes it helps. But I still don't feel respected in the schools. So I go back to the person that did initially help me because I know I can trust them. I also get a lot of information because I stay connected to the community and other families that have kids at Richmond Public Schools and that use WhatsApp. I also don't speak up a lot because sometimes I'm concerned or fear that if I say things or do the wrong thing, will I get in trouble with immigration? 
it's hard and confusing, but I just keep going back to my community, keep going back to WhatsApp, and try to do the best that I can because I work long hours, many days. And I know, I hear the school say that they want me to do more, and I want to do more, but I don't know if they hear me saying that I need someone to explain to me, to help me understand all of this. Who can do that for me? Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. That was very eye-opening. Ms. Garrett, this next question is for you. So I know that your children have been at RPS for a while now, but you've talked a lot about still not feeling as connected to the school, as well as just not really knowing how to raise your concerns. Is that true? So my question for you is, what are some of the challenges you face that have made it difficult to be engaged in your children's education? So I love my children, and their education is important to me. Uh, but I feel like I've been labeled as the uninvolved parent. I work long hours, and when I get calls from teachers or principals um, regarding my children, I can't get back to them right away. I make a priority to call back, uh, but it's after the school hours, so sometimes I can get the teachers and sometimes I can't. So I would love to be able to go to the school to the events. I would love to be able to go to school board meetings, but my husband and I work, and we work. We have one car, and we don't have anybody to watch our kids at night. So I need to know, like, what is RPS going to do for parents like me? I want to go to school board meetings and advocate for my children, not just my children, all RPS children, and for families like me. But I need some consideration but the fact that this is hard, like balancing life, children, work, education, it's a lot. So I need some folks to understand that working families like us, we need some consideration. Wow, Ms. Garrett, a lot of those barriers you named are probably common for a lot of RPS families. Mr. Hart, this last question is for you. So you purposely chose to send your children to RPS schools while many of your neighbors have chosen to move to the suburbs or selected private schools for their children. How have you advocated for your children to ensure that they have the best educational experience possible? Thank you, Ms. Batten, for that question and for the opportunity to share my experience here today. I have to admit that advocacy is a tough subject for me because while I recognize that I already come from a place with a lot of privileges, I really have to do what's best for my own children and family, even if that ultimately means leaving RPS altogether. Having grown up in one of the wealthier suburbs around the city of Richmond, I remember always having really positive relationships with my schools and my parents always were on a first name basis with each of my teachers and principals and even the superintendent. RPS faces a lot of challenges, but at least in the part of the city where I chose to live, the schools are solid, and ultimately we are building a lot of those same relationships that I remember having with schools when I was a child. The superintendent's communications have been extremely helpful. I find his emails to be very good and him to be even personally quite accessible. I've had a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations with him and have even rallied support across my community to have community meetings directly with the superintendent. The school board has also been receptive to me and to my family because we're able to rotate on attending each school board meeting. We're able to find child care if we need to, and our jobs generally end at 5 o'clock most days, so we can make it work. We may not agree with everything that RPS does, 
but I always feel like my voice is heard, especially on the big policy decisions. If RPS is really committed to listening to all of our families, will you still hear my voice as loudly? Thank you all for giving us that insight about your lived experiences as RPS parents. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron, who will talk more about how we plan to address the barriers that you all highlighted. Thank you, Ladisha and team. All right. So during our tell-all, you heard the burning questions that we receive from our families. How can we better help them understand how to navigate the school system? How can we make sure our working families can fully participate in their children's education? And how do we make sure that we continue to listen to the concerns of all families? As we pondered these questions, we realized that our ultimate responsibility as a division committed to authentic family engagement is to provide equitable access and equal partnership that allows our families opportunities to collaboratively create educational experiences for their children. Together with our partners from Child Savers and Parks and Recreation, the Richmond Public Schools team interviewed more than 100 diverse RPS families. Through these intimate conversations, we learned about the hopes and dreams that they have for their children, as well as the challenges that they faced as parents hoping to fully engage in their children's education. So let's make this a little bit more personal. Show of hands, people in this room, who has ever felt misunderstood, unseen, maybe unheard in a situation in your life? So I see most hands go up. That's a common experience for us. And usually for folks like us in this room, it lasts for a moment. You know, it's a situation and we see our way through it. Now I'd like you to imagine how you felt in that situation. And imagine how you would feel as a parent that didn't understand the educational system and that was your feeling for 12 years or more. It's overwhelming. So many of our families don't know how to make connections to advocate for their children. This really hit home for me recently when I was going through the IEP process with my five-year-old. Now I have two kids, my older son Harry, he was the easy one. I always say if we had Emma first, we wouldn't have had a second. That's, that's who she is. But he hit all the markers. I didn't need to do anything special to support his education because he just does everything the way you're expected to. But Emma is our special girl, and I knew she would need more support. And as she's entered kindergarten, I've been working with her teachers and the social worker and the exceptional education team to get her the resources that she needs to be successful. But what I realized during this process as an educator is that I was confused sometimes. I was frustrated. When they sent me the third hundred plus questionnaire, I was about to throw something at them. I said, how many questionnaires do I need to take for you to understand that she needs additional support? I can tell you what she needs. And then I thought about my work and our families. And I thought, how could I answer these questionnaires if I didn't have proficient English language skills? How could I make time to go to meetings at 10 a.m. and 1 o'clock at her school if I had a job where it wasn't flexible? And how could I understand all of this jargon, these education words that I've never used if maybe I didn't have as much education as others? And that's what made it so clear for me in that moment that this work that our team is doing is so important. So how do RPS parents get involved? Typically, we want our families to be involved at the school, local, and state level, if possible. At the school level, we want you to be in contact with your child's teachers. We want you to know how to contact them. We want you to be able to reach out to the principal, know who your guidance counselors are, what are those resources. 
At the local level, we want you to be able to reach out to your school board representative. We have nine elected officials in that body, and they make really far-reaching decisions that impact our families. But their primary role is to advocate for our families and represent them. Yet we find a lot of our families say, I don't know who my school board rep is, or I saw their name and a sign in the window, or they shook my hand at an event around election time. So how are you advocating for the people if you're not connected to the people and they don't know who you are. And then of course at the state level, we want our representatives, our delegates, our senators who are making impacting decisions for our whole state to know what it is that our Richmond families want and need. And largely that's around funding. We want to be fully funded to do the things that our students need. So during our landscape assessment, we were able to engage a lot of families and find out these themes that you heard in our earlier skit. And we found the themes really cut across racial, class, and language divides. Our Latin American families felt disconnected. They didn't always feel included, and they didn't understand how to navigate the system. And you heard that with Ms. Rodriguez's comments. Our working class families or our under-resourced black families had had negative experiences sometimes when they were a student in Richmond Public Schools, and there's some trauma there, so we have to build trust with them and relationships. And sometimes they just don't have the bandwidth to do one more thing because they're treading water to keep their family going. And you saw that with Ms. Garrett's comments. As a result, we saw that our families of color, our black and brown families, had less voice in the power structure that we have for our school system, and our more well-resourced middle-class families or our white families were more confident in their ability to advocate for their children and be actively involved. And you heard that with Mr. Hart's comments about knowing the superintendent, going to the school board, and being able to advocate in those ways. So what is our solution to these challenges? We wanna provide equitable access and power to resources. We wanna build effective communication channels across diverse stakeholder groups. And we wanna cultivate meaningful and lasting community trust in the school system. We leverage the research of Dr. Karen Mapp's dual capacity framework for family school partnerships to implement effective strategies at the school and division level. We leaned heavily into the idea that our role is to connect family engagement to student learning. If you're not in school and if you're not engaged, you can't be academically successful. We wanted to engage our families as co-creators and create welcoming cultures so that our families can take on roles as co-creators, advocates, and supporters, not spectators. To support our solution, the two initiatives we have implemented are our regional community hub model and division-wide engagement goals. So our community hubs model provides a bridge between schools and communities where we have full-time family liaisons who are in the community, connected to resources, represent our families, and they're able to help our families remove those barriers to engagement. Our liaisons are a direct reflection of our families. You can see that in our South Side region that has the most Latin American families in the city, and half of our liaisons for that region are bilingual. So we can make sure that we understand their culture and we are communicating in the language that they feel comfortable speaking. We use data in our community hubs to support a more strategic approach for attendance, a key indicator for engagement. You can see we have a tracker here. We use these trackers at every school to document our outreach. That means we know who is reaching out to students, when are they reaching out, what are they saying, and what do we need to do to help support these families. As of last week, we had 31,000 documented outreach to 10,000 unique students. Finally, we've reflected on our work with families and come to the realization that if we don't provide our school leaders with training and build their capacity, we're not gonna move family engagement at the division level. So we identified three areas for family engagement for all schools to focus on this year. Three is a good number. When you get beyond three, it gets confusing. You don't meet the goals. So the three goals are we wanna reduce chronic absenteeism because remember, if you're not in school, you're not learning. We want to increase family school communication and we want it to increase parent advocacy. 
So with the support of our superintendent and the leadership of our chief engagement officer, we trained all school leaders in the summer on how to move the needle on this, uh, these goals. We developed a feedback process and a data-driven monitoring system that we're using now to continue coaching them. So today we are pleased to have with us our inaugural chief engagement officer, Dr. Shade Harris and Ms. Audrey Trussell, the Vice President of Community Impact at the Community Foundation of Greater Richmond. So you know why we're here, guys. We, we want some money. Because we know that we can't do any of this work without funding. That's what we need to move the needle. And we know that funding and education is not always at the level that we need. And sometimes engagement and working with parents is going to come secondary to doing things in the classroom or doing things that support student learning much more. So we want to have the support of the Community Foundation to align on these goals and see how can we move the needle in the Richmond region. So we thought of three areas where we would want support. First, we want to partner with child care providers to support on-site enriching activities for students in grades K through five during the first two hours of our school board meetings that would allow parents to participate in public comment. And that's the portion where they can advocate for their students. So we'd provide a safe space for children, a meal, even transportation if we needed to. We want the creation of a community liaison role that would include a stipend for parents and caregivers working on central issues for the division to support the dissemination of broad information to families. And we want payment for parents and caregivers to serve on committees that need diverse representation. When we think about our families and the challenges and barriers they have, they know their community and their children best. So if we would pay a consultant thousands of dollars to tell us research, why wouldn't we pay somebody for their lived experiences? That's very important to us. It's equitable and it's ethical. So for these initiatives, we are asking for funding in the amount, and I'll say seed funding, because we may want more later. We want seed funding in the amount of $30,000 for the implementation during our 23-24 academic school year as we pilot these three ideas with an option of continued funding based on proof of concept, feedback from our participants, and results data. We know that these three areas are only a starting point and we need to do even more to make sure that we're engaging our families equitably. So, this RPS team, we're grateful for the two years that we've had with the Flamboyant Fellowship, and we're excited about launching our pilot and all of the strategies that we've implemented. But to end our presentation, we thought it was only right to let our families have the last word. So one of our team members who wasn't able to be here today, Rakia Cooper, not only works for Parks and Recreation, one of our partners, but she is also a parent of two RPS students. And so we wanted to end by hearing from Rakia, so I will let her have the final word. Hello, I'm Rakia Wajid. While I am part of Team Richmond, I'm also a parent of two RPS students. I've been a parent in RPS for close to 14 years. My daughter is a high school senior who is ranked number one in her class, and my son is a kindergartner who has been diagnosed with a special need. I was thrown into the world of advocacy pretty quickly with RPS. I had to figure out who to go to in order to make things happen. I befriended other parents and joined the PTA board. I volunteered and spent so much time in school that other parents actually thought I worked there. I was fortunate enough to be able to spend that much time at my child's school, but I'm vastly aware that this is not an option for most RPS families. My son has been diagnosed with level one autism spectrum disorder. That diagnosis led to experiencing a totally different side of RPS, and it was one that I was not familiar with. Where my daughter needed very little to be successful in this school system, my son requires support to aid in his development. I'm in constant contact with his school, his teachers, and his IEP team to ensure that he isn't being pushed aside and that his IEP is being followed. There has been a very steep learning curve, but I'm grateful to have had the time and resources to learn how to advocate for my children. But however, Many don't have this opportunity as the system currently stands. 
So we want to support parents by providing on-site childcare for students in grades K through five during the first two hours of school board meetings, by implementing a community liaison that would aid in disseminating information to families, and by offering payment for caregivers to serve on existing committees that need diverse representation. I've had to work harder than anyone should have to in order to successfully navigate this system. It shouldn't be this hard. And in other moments, I actually wonder how many parents are afraid because they just don't know how to fight for their children or for the right to be heard. I'm optimistic that the work Team Richmond has done will lead to all families being knowledgeable and confident in their abilities to have a voice so that all families, especially those who are traditionally underrepresented, have equitable access, effective ways to communicate, and trust in RPS. Thank you. Thank you for your time.